We are recording. All right. Today we're talking about adjunctions. So, uh, Saunders McLean said adjoint functors arise everywhere. Uh, and this is just very true. Um, all right. We should say what we're talking, we should define the things we're talking about. So given functors f from c to d and g from d to c, uh, we say that f is left adjoint to g, and g is right adjoint to f, so I'm fine with these terms, um, if, OK, we want a bijection from fx to y, from maps from fx to y, and maps from x to gy, for all uh, objects x in C and y in D, um, which is natural in x and y. And hopefully, we've sort of talked enough about naturality at this point that everyone is comfortable with what I mean by natural here, which is if I have a map from y to z in D, then I get a map from this to this but with z, and this but, and this but with um, g of z, and there's like a square that should commute. Um, and we'll see what we mean by that in a second. Uh, so for notation, for these things together, I'm going to write uh, f turnstile g. And the sort of pointy bit of the turnstile points towards the left adjoint. So if I had put the left adjoint on the right for some reason, then this would be the other way around. Um, we also often write, uh, say, f, c, d, g. And we have f going this way, g going this way. And I would write that to say that um, f is left adjoint to g because the turnstile is pointing towards f. Um, Sorry? Yeah, I mean, the, the point is that this points towards however you happen to diagram the thing. Um, and we'll see some examples explicitly of things written that way, um, the way that you mentioned. So uh, let's name this bijection, say, in this direction. We'll call it phi. Uh, maybe I'll give it subscript xy to say that it's it's between um, those two. And so we call the triple f, g, phi an adjunction um, and given two pairs of adjoint functors might have um, different ways of having this a bi natural bijection between these maps. <coughs> All right. So give it, yes. Is there a way of writing this in some sort of natural transformation? 
There is, and we'll get, we'll get to that. Um, so given uh, a map f from fx to y, we write f bar for the map x to gy across this adjunction. So f lives here, and it gets sent to something across this, sorry, this bijection, across this bijection, and we're going to call the thing it gets sent to f bar. And similarly, if we have g from x to gy, we'll write we'll write g bar for the map from fx to y. So if we start on this side with g and we come back across this bijection, we're going to write g bar for that. So in particular, bar bar is the identity. Um, black sheep. Um, so we would call. Uh, this, this is the um, adjoint, or some people might call it the transpose of f. And similarly, this is the adjoint or transpose of g. All right. Uh, so I've just said natural. We should say what naturality in x is, because we're going to use this. Naturality in x. Did I do x? Yeah, I did x. All right. All right, this is starting to go. All right, so we're going to start with some map f from w to x in c. All right, the naturality square that we want to satisfy is from f of x d f w y c x of g y and c x of oh. c w. Why? OK. So here we have this bijection, x, y. Here we have the w, y bijection. And then we have maps here. All right, on this side, we just have f upper star. So this is pre-composition with f. So we take a map here. We pre-compose it with f. We get a map here. Here, it's also pre-composition, but it's from f of x, a map. We need a map from f, f of w to f of x. So we use f of f up a star. All right. And now we want to say what this. So to say that we haven't, so I'm saying, I'm assuming we start with an adjunction, and I'm asking, what is this? naturality in x mean? Like, what, what condition has to be satisfied? So we want to send g to g bar. And then this way, we want to send g to g composed with f of f. So we want to send that to g of f of f bar. And then here, we want to send g bar to g bar f. And so for this, for this bijection to be natural in x, we need these two to be equal so that the square commutes. So what are these? Explicitly, what are these two maps? Well, we have this f of f composed with g. So f of f goes from f of w to f of x. So this is f of f. And then g goes from f of x 
to y, so that's g, and we're asking that the bar of this composition, so the adjoint of this composition, uh, so this is, so we started with a map f of w to y, so the adjoint of this is a map from w to g of y. We want this to be equal to this composition, so f goes from w to x, that's f, and then g bar, so g bar goes from x to g y, because g went from f of x to y. All right, so we're asking for this thing to hold. So because I have a lot to cover today, I've, given, I've left a lot of things as exercises. Um, so what is naturality in Y? So you should find a similar, a similar square that needs to commute, and you should figure out a similar, con a similar um, sort of condition that that induces, that looks like this condition here. All right. <coughs> uh, so Kelly was asking if we had a natural isomorphism. Uh, and if C and D are, are locally small, which most of the things we want to consider are, um, then um, an adjunction is a natural isomorphism of this form. So we have C op plus D set, and then we have a functor that takes us to maps in D between F of blank and blank, and a functor that takes us to maps in C between blank and G of blank, and we have a natural transformation like that, a natural isomorphism. All right, let's see some examples. Uh, and maybe I'll move, but no, maybe I want to keep this up for now. Um, so, examples. So, uh, I'm going to write. Free forget. All right, so many forgetful functors have left adjoints. Particularly in algebra, such functors are called free functors. Um, in fact, if you are given a category which forgets, <coughs> which forgets into another category by a fully faithful embedding, a left adjoint in the other direction is a good definition of free functor. So, the reason I say a fully faithful embedding is because um, if you take, so you can like forget the category of topological spaces into the category of set, but the problem is that like lots of different topological spaces have the same underlying set, and so while you there is while that does have a left adjoint, it's somehow not as good a like definition of free like. Somehow you, you don't necessarily want to call that free, whereas if you forget groups into set, you want to consider the, the, um, the left adjoint in the other direction. You want to consider that the free group on the set. Um, it's because it's, it's a different type of structure. Like when we do algebraic structure later, I'll talk about how, it's, how we encode algebraic structure. And that's very different from how you. There are categorical ways to include what a top. To, there are categorical ways to describe what a topological structure on a set is, 
but they're very different from the things that we consider when we say, well, this is a group object in the category of sets, so it's a group. It's, um, yeah. there's, there's, there's like a meaningful distinction between those types of structure, I guess is what I'm saying. All right, so let's recall, rel, let's recall uh, the example um, that I have sort of used the most in this series of lecture, which is the uh, free functor from set to mon. So the free monoid on a set. So we defined objects by uh, this sort of diagrammatic universal property uh, where a map from the free monoid to any monoid corresponds to a set map from the um, from the uh, set to that monoid. So this is in set. This is in set, and this is um, there exists a unique monoid homomorphism. All right, and given some map from x to y, f, uh, we had that, well, we have a map to f of x. So the information of f of x includes this, um, <coughs> includes this uh, map from f x to f of x, which um, in the language that we saw last time is a universal element. Um, and then we also have one to f of y. But this then is a map of sets or underlies a map of sets, and so we get a map this way. Um, and in particular, uh, if we start with x a set and y a monoid, we can forget that y is a monoid. So applying u, which is the forgetful functor, Um, what am I doing? Um, oh, and then we can take this map of sets from the set underlying y to the monoid y, which is just the identity. It's, I mean, it's not the identity because this is a set and this is a monoid. But, um, and by the universal property, so we started, we started with some f here. We have this map from the set underlying the monoid y to the monoid y, which just sends an element to itself. This is just an element of, this is just a function. Um, we have this function, and that gets us a map here, which I'm going to call f bar. Um, so I want to say this diagram is not this diagram, because, because this map comes from the sort of definition of a free functor on y. This map is just a map of sets from y to itself. Um, sorry? F is the free functor. Oh, no, oh, this is just okay. This is the this is the information I'm starting with. I'm starting with a map from f from x, a map of sets from x to the set underlying y. That's the information I'm starting with. And the point is that the um, the universal property of the free monoid on x tells me there's a unique map such that this commutes. Um, but also note that if I have a map from this monoid to this monoid, I get a map from this to the underlying set just by taking that, um, taking this map and restricting it to the the one length strings. Or, yeah, um, and so this shows us that the collection of maps from 
the free monoid on x to the set to the monoid y is in bijection with the collection of maps from this set x to the set underlying y. Um, so, yes. Yes. When you go from the set of y to y, mm -hmm. the different operations are generating the free monoid back to the set. So this is not a free monoid. Yeah. This this map is just I, this is just a map of sets sending a set to itself basically. <coughs> um. All right, so uh, if we let f be a map from w to x, we have, all right, what do we have? We have that g circ f of f bar w. OK, so. We're starting with um, a map G circ F of F, where G is um, G is some map here, right? So it's a map from F of F of X to Y, uh, and then we we. Sick. This all made sense when I wrote it down yesterday. Yeah, so we're starting with a map from f of x to y. f of f is a map from um, f of w to f of x. So this is a map from f of w to f of x to y. Uh, so it starts from. Um, it's, so this is a map down here that goes from f of x, uh, f of w to y, this map here. Yeah? So um, uh, I could draw this out. I didn't want to go into too much detail. I don't want to get, want to get too bogged down into the details here. Um, but the point is that on w, um, which is, so what, what we have now is like, um, f of w, uh, w, we have this. Um, annoyingly, this is, this is now g and g bar. Um, so, but we have something that looks like this, right? We have something that looks like this. Uh, if you started with a w here, the, the string on one thing, if you go around this way, it's the same as just like doing this top thing to W. So this is actually just uh, G of F of F of W. The point being that on the generators, the bar does the same thing as the thing at the top. Yeah? People are happy with that? OK. All right, um, but also on the genera on the generators, the free thing. So that was that was sort of this bit, but also on the generators, the free thing just does the same thing at the top here. So that gets me that this is actually the just G of F of W, which is G bar of FW, because FW is like a one string word in here, um, and so is the same on, on the generator. And this is the condition that we wanted to show for naturality in X. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want to pass this too closely, um, but yeah, if you're unhappy with it, you should, you should go through it carefully. I mean, it's just an exercise in writing out what these maps are.
No, like I'm not. The bar off and it hits you and just sits. No, so this this is this is this is from x to g of y. No, this is sorry, this is from w to g of y. This is from uh Sorry, yes. This is this is this is from f of this is from f of w No way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No the Right. So the the abusive notation that's happening here is that I'm treating the one string, the one the, I'm treating the one string w in here as the same thing as w in here. That's the abuse that's happening. Um, the point being that um, because on this end it's like it's it's really inequality. If you think about that as being inequality, then these are the same element. All right, uh, and. Exercise check naturality in Y. So you should come up with a condition here, and then you should check that this satisfies the condition. All right. So this extends to other free things that we've defined. So we can take the. Uh, Free group on a set, and we have that these are adjoint functors, free and forgetful. Uh, you can take, you can similarly take the free abelian group on a set. Uh. All right, in the same vein, we can take sort of the free abelian group on a group. Um, and that's abelianization. So I have a forgetful functor from abelian groups to groups that just forgets that it's in the category of abelian. In fact, you, should, you can think of this as including the subcategory of abelian groups into groups. It's the same functor. Um, this has a left adjoint, and that left adjoint is abelianization. Um, so if people haven't seen it, given a group G, um, it's abelianization. G ab is the group quotient by this thing, uh, where GG is the um, is the commutator subgroup of G, uh, and it's the normal subgroup generated by. Um, Elements of the form G H G inverse H inverse. So this is a work. This is like I said. I'm giving lots of exercises this time. So here are some worthwhile exercises for abelianization. I've only told you what this thing does on uh, objects. You should show that this is a functor by figuring out what it should do on maps. Um, and it should be an obvious thing and not like a, a contrived thing. Um, I'm just going to move this. Right, great. <coughs> then you should show that abelianization is left adjoint to forget. Um, 
you should check that uh, GAB satisfies a universal property uh, and describe the um, representing functor and the universal element. Uh, and maybe also recover a diagram uh, showing this universal property. All right. More examples. OK. So uh, from the category of monoids and the category of groups, all right, we can forget that a group is a group and just remember that it's a monoid. This has a left adjoint, which you can think of as free. Uh, and it has a right adjoint. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about the left adjoint, but the right adjoint um, sends a monoid uh, to its group of invertible elements. Uh, and it just sends a group homomorphism to that group homomorphism restricted to the invertible elements. All right. Another example, or rather, we'll see a non example. Uh, I'm not going to prove this is a non example. I hope that I can come to it. Uh, later in the course, but I don't know if we'll have time. Um, the forgetful functor from the category of fields to set has neither left or right adjoints. Um, Yes, you you can have free. You can there are, there. You can definitely take a set and generate a free ring on it. All right. Let's. All right. Uh, here's an interesting one. We have set and top, and so we can forget that a set is a topological space. Um, and just remember the underlying set. And we have left and right adjoints, one I'll call D, one I'll call I. Uh, so U is forget D uh, takes a space X and sends it to the topological space X with the topology that's the power set. So this is. Takes a, spe takes a set and sends it to the topological space with the discrete topology. Um, so the topology is just every subset. Every subset is open. Is the All right, and I takes a set x to the indiscrete topology, which the only open sets are the empty set and the whole thing. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. All right. Um, OK, here's an important example that we have seen before. So I'm going to call it tensor hom. And the other day we called it currying. Yes, delicious. Um, all right, so we have. Uh, fixing some set X, we have taking the Cartesian product with 
x is left adjoint to taking maps from x into something. So uh, recall from, I think, last time, or maybe the time before, that, um, no, last time, because last time was when we were talking about representability, that um, the functor set from blank across x to y is a functor from set op to set. And we said it was represented by the set x to the power of y, uh, y to the power of x, which is the set of maps from the set of functions from x to y. So the fact that it's represented by that means that set w x y is in bijection with set w uh, set x, y. Um, and this is occurring, which we talked about last time. So if we start with a map from x cross, uh, from w cross x to y, it sends it to the map which sends, so it has to send an element of w somewhere, and it sends it to, OK, it has to send it to a function from x to y. It sends it to the function that sends x to f of wx. Yes? Wait, what are you talking about? Yeah, so we have this informal junction with those two functors. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes to recall, we have a slightly different. Yeah, so this was something we said last time. Yeah, but with that functor trend. So the. So the The point is, we start with a W and a and a and an a, a W and a Y. For the adjunction, we start with we we're like the thing that we want this to be natural in is W and Y, um, because when we defined what an adjoint was, we sort of started with an X and a Y of um, of representability that we had last time. <coughs> OK. So lots of these things like link very, like there's a lot of, all of these things are secretly the same in category theory. <coughs> all right. Uh, one more example. And then we'll move on. All right, so if we have uh, rings R and S. Um, and M is an R S bimodule. Okay, so I don't know if everyone knows what a bimodule is. If you have a ring, you can take a module over it. Um, which implies like multiplication. You can have a left module and you can have a right module. So M is an RS by module. If it's a left R module, so you can act on it by multiplying by elements of R on the right, and a right S module, and you can multiply it by elements on the right. Sorry, you can multiply by R on the left and by S on the right. Um, and I think there's some compatibility condition like. Because if you have like R, M, S, I think you want like multiplying this to be equal to multiplying on the other side first. Um, 
I think that's the only condition, uh, but it's been a while, so I'm not sure. All right, uh, then we have, OK, we have this pair, a joint pair. So it's tensoring by R, M, and that goes from right R modules to uh, right S modules. And on the other side, we have HOM S from M blank. OK, so if we have a right R module, we can take a tensor product like this. So M is a left R module, and blank is a right R module, then you can tensor over R. Um, yes. So. There is going to be a universal property like that, but um, the way to think about it is, say, if I have x tensor over r with m, where m is a left r module and x is a right r module, then I want um, x. Let's see. I want um, x tensor r m to be equal to x r. Tensor M. So the point is that if I have multiplication by R on the left here, I can just move it to multiplication on the left by X. Uh, multiplication of X on the left by R. Like I can just move the elements of multiplication by elements of R across the tensor. Um, OK. <coughs> and so if we have a right S module, M is also a right S module, so we can ask about. Um, S linear morphisms, from, like a module module homomorphisms from M, right right S module homomorphisms, no homomorphisms, right S linear maps from um, M to S. That's a that's a thing that exists, and because M is a right R module, this set of maps is a right R module because we can multiply on the right. On, if we have a map from um, M to S, we can like multiply this map on the, right, on the left by R by multiplying elements by R. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I have F, if I have this map, I also have a map um, R times F to S, and this map sends M to F of Rm. So I'm just multi yeah, I'm just multiplying in here, and that so that that gives this set of maps the structure of a left arm, uh, I guess of a right arm module. I guess you multiply it. Um, all right. Great. So, um, so we have that hom s of a tensor over r m to b is um, the same as hom r of a to hom. Uh, S from M to B. Uh, invisible means. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, so this is also tensor homojunction. Um, and so in fact, uh, it's like. This adjunction is given precisely by the same thing here. Uh, maybe sticking in tensors where you need to. So like this would be W tensor X instead of W comma um, T. But it's the same, it's the same bijection. <coughs> All right. Um, what time is it? And keep going. Um, All right. 
So maybe I'll erase from these examples. So importantly, junctions compose. So I have some adjunction between F and D. Let's say between F and G. So like that. And then I have some adjunction for between D and F, E. So H, K. All right. Then maps in E between H, F, X, and Y. Sorry, between it. So I want to. So for some X and C, I've applied F and H and got something here. And then starting with some Y and E, this collection of maps is in bijection with uh, maps from F of X. K of y. Uh, and so this is by this adjunction. Um, and then by the other adjunction, that's in bijection with maps from x to g, k of y. Um, and the point is that each of these bijections are natural in x and y. So this whole bijection is natural in x and y. So uh, H composed with F is left adjoint to G composed with K. All right. Now we're going to see another definition of adjoint. Um, so this is the unit co-unit definition of a junction. Um, some People often have arguments about which of them is better. Uh, I like the Homset one. Um, but actually, in writing, in, in, in writing up for this, uh, I have come around to the idea that maybe the unit co-unit one isn't quite so bad. All right, so we're going to start with uh, f, g, and phi, uh, n. A junction, a junction, and so F C D. So F is the left adjoint to G. All right. For some object in C, uh, we have the standard bijection. Except I'm going to do it from f of x to f of x. And so this is in bijection with maps from x to g f of x. Right? This is just from our, our original definition of a junction. Um, and then the identity on f of x has to go somewhere across this bijection, and I'm going to call this eta of x. So let uh, eta of x be defined to be the adjoint of the identity on f of x. So now this is a map from x to g f of x. All right. Similarly, for y and d, we have uh, this bijection from f g of y to y with maps from uh, g of y to g of y. And so now I can ask where the identity on g of y goes across in this bijection. And I'm going to call this epsilon of y. 
So then I'm going to put uh, say let uh, let epsilon of y be defined to be the identity on g of y with the adjoint of that map. And this is a map from f g of y to y. Um, OK. Now we're going to, so these are components of natural transformations. <coughs> we have a natural transformation between the identity on C and the composition G of F, or GF, and we're going to call that eta. And we also have a natural transformation uh, between FG and the identity on D. And we're going to call this epsilon. All right. Um, uh, this is eta is the unit of um, the adjunction. And epsilon is the co-unit of the adjunction. Right, all right. And now I've written here claim. No, I really just mean lemma. Um, these natural transformations satisfy um, something called the triangle identities. So, uh, okay, maybe I'll write a lemma. Um, Eta and epsilon satisfy the triangle identities. Ugh. Chalk is better. So what are these? Um, maybe I should actually written the word triangle, but I'm lazy. Um, so this is. We have the func functor f. We have the functor f g f. The functor f. And if we do f to eta and epsilon to f, this is the identity on f. Um, so I want this to commute, and I want this to commute. So I have g g f g. G, this is A to G, and this is G epsilon, this is the identity in G. All right, this is a bit, I want this to commute. This is a bit maybe not clear what this means at the moment. Um, these are diagrams, these are commutative diagrams in the categories. Of, this is in the category of functors from C to D, and this is in the category of functors from D to C. Um, so maps between them are natural transformations. So these things are natural transformations. Uh, but like more concretely, so I would say equivalently, what I'm asking for is that given any x in C, I want uh, this diagram to commute. So f, g, f, x, f of x. So I want this to be the identity on f of x. I want this to be uh, epsilon f of x. All right, so yes. Oh, thank you. So I want this to commute, and I want g of y, g of g y, g of y. All right. So I want this to be the identity on g of y. I want this to be um, eta of g y. This to be g 
g of i to epsilon of y. I want this to commute. OK, so eta, yeah? What, what have you written as written for the FG index? Right, so the point is that epsilon, epsilon goes from FG of something to something. And the something here is f of x. Like, it takes us from fg of something to that something. And this takes us from fg of f of x to f of x. Uh, and in here, eta x is a map from x to g of f of x. And so we're just applying f, the functor f to the map. Um, that's how we get that. And similar things are happening here. So eta y or eta x is a map, or eta something is a map from something to g of f of something. Here the something is g of y, so this is a map from g of y to g of f of g of y. Um, yeah. And here, again, where eta of y is if you take off these g's, and so we apply g to that map, and we get a map from g of those things. OK. <coughs> All right, so note that we have that epsilon of f of x is equal to the identity of on g f of x, right? Because um, epsilon of x is the identity of g of x. And so epsilon of f of x is the, ident is the adjoint to the identity of g f of x. All right, so what does that tell us? That tells us that the identity on f of x, well, this is equal to, so the identity of f of x is the adjoint to eta of x. So the identity of f of x is, um, <coughs> a to x adjoint. Um, so this is, well, I can um, expand this out and get x g of x, oh, sorry, x to, to uh, so eta of x is from x to g of f of x. Uh, and here I can just put the identity on g of fx, so that's g of fx. So this is still the same map as eta of x, so its adjoint is the same as the adjoint of eta of x. <coughs> <coughs> now, by this naturality condition that we found earlier, this is equal to uh, the map f of x to f g f of x to f of x, where this is f eta x, and this is the adjoint of the identity of g f of x. All right, let's see that. So I'm going from this side to this, well, really, I'm, go I'm going from, sorry, I'm going from this side. Okay, I'm going from this side to this side. So if we stack adjoints on, if I stack another bar on each of these sides, then I get that this without the bar is equal to this with the bar. So I'm starting with f is a to x. g bar is the identity between g of f of x. And so I should get back. So I get f of eta of x, and I get um, I get g. So I yeah. So I get back this this bar over the identity. Okay, but this this is equal to um, well, this side stays the same. 
that's just f inner of x. And this is epsilon, uh, this is epsilon of f of x. Because that's how we define epsilon. It's the adjoint to the identity. So it's the adjoint to the identity. Um, great. So this is uh, epsilon f of x composed with f of a to x. And that's precisely this diagram. Uh, so this shows this diagram commutes. Uh, all right. Exercise. Use the other naturality condition that you came up with in my previous exercises to show this commutes. All right. Um, maybe let's take a real quick break here. <laughs>